Okay, Mr. Coon, we can begin the committee meeting. Thank you. Good morning. I now call to order the meeting of the audit committee for Wednesday, April 15th, 2020. In accordance with the mandate direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public and non-essential personnel through April 24th, 2020, in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. The Board of Education's resolution approved on March 10th, 2020, board meeting stated that in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend these portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's audit committee meeting is being held remotely and is being broadcast through live stream on the BCPS website and on BCPS TV, Comcast, Xfinity Channel 73, and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this, after, this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. So I want to take a moment to welcome everybody. I know that um, being virtual is a new way for us to doing business, and it takes some getting used to. Um, so let's afford each other, um, you know, the time necessary to answer and uh, complete this in a very structured manner. Um, and I thank everyone for taking the time to join today. I know that we all have um, other obligations um, and, uh, you know, we're doing our best to, to make these committee meetings happen. Um, Ms. Duckworth, could you please conduct a roll call of the committee members? Yes, sir. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Joes? Present. Mr. Kuhn? Here. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Stockworth, could you please conduct a roll call of the staff members? Yes, sir. Ms. Barr? Here. Ms. Berna? Mr. Dixon? Yes. Mr. Fletcher? I'm here. Ms. Manna? Here. Mr. Saris? I'm here. Dr. Scriven? Present. Ms. Stevens? Here. Are there any other participants that I did not call? Um, Jennifer, this is Barbara. I'm here as well. I was just on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Okay, that is it, Mr. Coon. Thank you. The first item on our agenda is the approval of minutes. We're going to be discussing the February 2020 meeting minutes um, do I have a motion to accept, accept the minutes? minutes? Mr. Kuhn, I, I have a, a amendment to the minutes. Should I make that now or after? moving to accept them. 
Well, let's discuss your amendment to the minutes. In item two, unfinished business, paragraph B, under distribution of audit reports, the second paragraph under that, where uh, the committee was discussing the information uh, presented by Ms. Barr. Uh, the last sentence states that Ms. Barr confirmed the current practice and noted that the previous audit committee chair was copied on audit reports. And I just wanted to uh, amend that sentence. Ms. Barr confirmed the current practice and informed the audit committee that the previous audit committee chair was copied on audit reports. I move that be added. Is there a second? I'll second it. And, and who was that? I'm sorry, who second in the motion? It was Lisa Mac. Is there any further discussion about um, modifying the minutes? With no further discussion, we'll move that motion to a vote. Ms. Duckworth, can you take um, a roll call? Vote. Yes, sir. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Hen? Abstain. Ms. Joes? Abstain. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Kuhn, that is three in favor, two abstained. Thank you. With the majority, um, the minutes will be amended. Do I have a motion to now accept the minutes? I move that the minutes be accepted as amended. Second. Ms. Duckworth, please conduct a roll call of the committee for the vote. Yes, sir. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Hen? Abstain. Ms. Joes? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. That's four in favor and one abstention. The motion carries. The next item of business on our agenda is unfinished business. Um, there is a discussion regarding board projects, uh, construction change orders, in our previous um, committee meeting. And I'm going to open up the floor for discussion regarding this item. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. This is Mrs. Causey. And at the prior committee meeting held on February 18th, there is discussion, and that is contained in the minutes. Uh, in um, Subsequent to that meeting in discussion with Ms. Hen, who did not have the opportunity to attend that meeting, in addition to audit committee possibly including construction issues in data analytics, Ms. Hen had brought up that the uh, review of construction change orders is not just related to the data analytics, but also had some qualitative analysis that would be helpful and that would um, 
warrant being uh, discussed. So I wanted to um, open up the opportunity for Ms. Hen to clarify for the audit committee um, the, the qualitative analysis and how and why the construction change orders uh, would be something helpful for the audit committee to review. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Yes, um, the scope of work involved in this project, I believe, is outside the realm of the capabilities of any type of automated analytics tool or solution that that could provide. I was not um, privy to the discussion at the last meeting. However, I am aware of the scope that was intended by introducing this project. Um, this is one that I'm intimately familiar with and that would require a qualitative um, analysis with eyes on each particular change order to gauge the, the nature of the order, um, the approvals related to that order, and that is much more labor intensive versus um, something that, and that would be more suited to an analytics project that could be flagged by some type of um, rule or, or process that would necessarily catch any, any type of um, errant activity. So I wanted to revisit this in terms of um, how we wanted to address that moving forward. Are there any other committee members that would like to discuss this, or, or do we yes. need to ask this questions is, of staff? This is Molly. I do have some questions, and this might be directed to Ms. Burnoff or Mr. Dixit. Currently, all of your construction change orders are tracked because you have to approve them or not. So there already is a system in place where you're tracking change orders for every contract. The second thing I want to point out is that this is a board project, uh, not an audit committee project. So I really would like for this to come for discussion in front of the full board and have the board decide what special project they want to proceed with. So for that, I would like to move that this, I move that this uh, board special project be taken uh, brought in front of the full board for discussion. Thank you for your comment, Ms. Josie. Are there any other comments from board members? Mr. Kuhn, I, have I did a have... Go ahead. Mr. Kuhn, I did have a comment, but um, if there's not a second... Um, then dealing with the motion on the floor, if, if there's not a second, then can we move forward? Well, I wanted to, I had a comment and I wanted to share that um, and then we can discuss, or do we need to go to a second and then have discussion? I just have some basic mechanical discussion that I think that we need to have. And I know that in the last meeting, we discussed analytics and the ability and the understanding of the information that's out there. And my understanding, and hopefully, and this is a question for Andrea and her staff, um, has there been any further review of the possibility of doing um, any kind of study regarding this and, and or um, a further review of an approach that may be taken to review this information? Russ, this is Andrea. Um, now, we did not have the opportunity to further explore any possibilities other than what was previously discussed at the February Audit Committee meeting. Okay. Because we just talked about the potential in the previous um, the pre as reflected in the previous minutes. So it's still, in my mind, um, the 
potential means it's not clear whether or not you have the capability as as a group to do um, some analytical review. Is is that accurate, or do you have the ability? Well, we would have to coordinate with uh, Mr. Dixit and his staff and um, the accounting department to make sure that we would have access to the data and information that we need. But based on Ms. Hen's comments, I think it's a completely different direction than what we discussed at the audit committee meeting. And um, you know, with Ms. Joe's concern about uh, it being a board project and not an audit committee project, so I guess we would need clarification as to what the expectation truly is and what you're really trying to accomplish. And then that would help us decide whether or not the project is appropriate for internal audit or perhaps um, Mr. Dixit or other superintendent staff. Mr. Kuhn, this is Julie. If I may comment, I think it's important to take a step back and define um, board project and understanding and it might be helpful for Ms. Joes as well to have some background information since she recently joined the audit committee in terms of how we arrived at um, defining what a board project is in terms of um, we had budgeted for a position to be assigned to internal audit specifically for the purpose of board work and that how that evolved, and perhaps Ms. Barr, you could speak to that, um, how that evolved into the allocation of hours within internal audit for what we are deeming to be board projects, because I think what we're grappling with here is actually a governance issue in terms of what um, issues need to come before the full board versus work that is um, that the internal or that the audit committee rather oversees in terms of that allotment of hours um, provided to internal audit assigned for for what we are deeming to be board projects or the use of um, that resource that the board budgeted for for the internal audit group. So Ms. Barr, could you perhaps elaborate on that or provide some background or clarify as needed for um, Ms. Joe's Sure. Well, at, at the last audit committee meeting, um, we did go back to the FY20 strategic work plan that was approved by this audit committee. And it does state that projects identified because of board motions will be completed in accordance with the Office of Internal Audit Operations and Reporting Protocols. So you are correct that we did get additional resources, but it was, it was with my understanding, that it would be um, projects that would come to the office as a result of the consensus of the board and not necessarily as a result of a vote of the uh, only the audit committee. So, and, and as we explained at the last meeting, our work plan has budgeted hours in it. And I think there was a concern that perhaps the hours weren't being used. However, they are, they, those hours were used, and um, I would like to remind the committee members that we did have two individuals on extended medical leave, so some of those hours that were actually assigned to projects had to be reallocated um, to medical leave or, or sick leave. So again, our work plan is a budget, and the hours are budgeted to the best of our ability at the beginning of the year, but as with everything else in any other budget, there has to be adjustments throughout the year. So again, as I've said before, and in the past, it was my understanding that these board projects were to be as a result of a board motion or consensus of the board. And, and I just read to you the line from our strategic work plan um, that says that's what it's supposed to be. So um, that's why I think we just think we need clarification. Hi, this is Lisa. Can I make a point? Go ahead, Ms. Max. Um, 
I do know there I do think there are important decisions that need to be taken to the full board, but I think if everything we talk about in this committee needs to be taken to the full board, it negates ha needing to have this committee. Um, we don't do that in other committees, and I don't think we should set the precedent here that everything we talk about should be taken to the full board. Mr. Kuhn, this is Ms. Causey. May I speak? Go ahead, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, I also think a little background is helpful at this point. So um, related to Ms. Hen, who is the chair of the Buildings and Contracts Committee uh, that does uh, the work when the construction contracts are brought to the board, uh, the Buildings and Contracts Committee does the work evaluating those, making sure there's information sufficient available before it comes to the full board for a vote. Um, and in those construction contracts, it is typical that there is a 10% that is added to the contract for change orders. But then those change orders do not come back to the board so that there is that at least 10% of the cost of a contract, construction contract, and these are in the millions of dollars, that the board does not receive information about. So there is that in terms of the construction change orders um, where there is not that governance piece and it is something that is significant dollars that we have spent in the past and so there is an opportunity to evaluate uh, the qualitative process as Ms. Hen pointed out but also the quantitative process and implications um, because we have uh, done a, a and I'm very grateful that we have received state and county funding to do uh, so many construction projects that we need in this school system to uh, leave uh, overcrowding and also to address our aging infrastructure. Um, but there is also an opportunity to improve. So I think what would be helpful is uh, instead of taking an idea to the full board, I uh, agree with Ms. Mack that the work of the committee is so that the board meetings can be run efficiently with enough information coming to the full board to make good decisions at that time. So I think what would be helpful is to have, a, if the audit committee uh, agrees, is to have a work group of Ms. Hen and someone appointed by Dr. Williams' staff uh, from uh, Mr. Scriven's um, Office of Operations and um, to work on the parameters of what might be um, helpful and uh, so that that is how I would uh, suggest moving the work forward. Um, I would also like to point out that in the Office of Internal Audit Operations Manual on page B3.1 uh, when it uh, speaks to operations protocol that Board Policy 8400 establishes the authority and the Internal Audit Charter establishes the responsibilities of the Office of Internal Audit. And the operations protocol ensures that the Office of Internal Audit follows an approved audit work plan. So the chief audit executives do have the responsibility to submit the annual work plan to the Board Audit Committee for its approval, which has been done on an annual basis. And then it is also um, the responsibility of the audit executives to obtain approval from the board chair and or the board audit committee chair for any significant additions, deletions, and or changes to the approved work plan. So um, I think that in working with the operations protocol, but also with the spirit of our committee and board members uh, working collaboratively together and also with the superintendent staff to improve efficiencies um, and uh, to streamline our operations, that it would be helpful to form just that, uh, have a meeting set, as I said, with Ms. Hen, who is a member of the Audit Committee, but also the chair of the Buildings and Contracts Committee, to really uh, work on what are those uh, analyses that need to be done. And I'll let Ms. Hen speak to that suggestion. Um, this is Molly. I would like to respond to this. Um, First of all, thank you, Ms. Barr, for explaining this about board approval. Second of all, last night, Ms. Hen, you were adamant that everything come to the full board for transparency. So I don't need mansplaining on board special projects and a word salad thrown at me. I'm simply asking that the full board get to discuss or be aware of this. Secondly, Ms. Causey, 
When you talk about the 10% contingency, that is standard. I work in construction and engineering. So anything that's any special project, whether it's 10 million, 50 million, it will always have a 10% contingency thrown in. Now, when you have changes made to that, that is brought to the uh, authorizing uh, board, whoever is approving it. I have no problems with reviewing this or keeping this as a special project to review those change orders to see if they're relevant or what contractor may be sending in contingencies if they're front-loaded um, cost estimates done, and then what do just win a project. So I understand that. So I don't need that mansplaining done to me. What I'm simply asking is that this be brought to the full board so they're aware and we can proceed with this special project, the board thinks it's important. It's not called an audit committee special project. It's called a board special project. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Josie. So we have your motion on the floor, and there is no second. Is there anyone that is going to second Ms. Josie's motion? Of course not. Nobody's going to second it. And I don't care, but I am going to bring this to the What I would suggest in order to manage your expectations and share information with the board is that we take the step that Ms. Causey outlined about having just a, a work group with Ms. Hen. And you can be a part of it if you would like to. Uh, to outline what that might look like and to outline the parameters of what this type of a project, uh, audit, um, special uh, board project would look like. Then we can report back to the board after we have determined what the scope is and clarified it for the internal audit office and move forward that way. Mr. Kuhn, this is Ms. Hen. I would support that approach. This is Ms. Causey. I would support that approach. So do we have a motion to create that work group to develop the parameters of the project? Mr. Kuhn, I'll make that motion to develop a work group with Ms. Hen and any other audit committee member that would volunteer or that you would select in order to uh, move that work forward. Does anyone else want to be on, on that work group with Ms. Hen? This is uh, Dr. Scriven. I would make a recommendation that the proposal be uh, taken to the superintendent and subsequently prior to volunteering that he would have an opportunity uh, to weigh in on potentially who he would want from his staff to serve on uh, that work group. So that's the a recommendation, Mr. Kuhn, that I would, would make at this, this time. So we just leave it open to um, Ms. Hen and perhaps Mr. Dixit and then whoever else the superintendent wishes to add to the group. Would that meet yes. the need? Yes, sir. I would even pause with, with Mr. Dixit at this time. And until okay. the proposal has been moved for to the superintendent for his review and an opportunity to weigh in. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Scriven. And uh, what I would like to do, Mr. Kuhn, is uh, withdraw my motion and and uh, have a, a new motion. I would like to move that Ms. Hen meet with the superintendent to discuss a audit committee project related to construction change orders 
to discuss qualitative and quantitative analysis and any scope. Is there a second? I'll second. second. Ms. Duckworth, <clears throat> excuse me. Can you please call roll call vote? Yes, sir. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. It is unanimous. Motion carries. Now we'll move on to the next agenda item, the new business. And the discussion here is related to the idea of a board project to discuss the impact, the fiscal impact of employees on administrative leave. Mr. Kuhn, point of order. The, yes. um, before we continue with this item, I would like to note that the live stream has an outdated version of the agenda showing and would like to request, if I can, that the current agenda be displayed on the live stream. Okay, well, while staff addresses that, all let's set, all set. move forward, sure. please, to the new business. Okay. So this is an idea I'd like to present to the committee. I feel it's important for the full board to understand the fiscal impact of our HR policies and procedures around placing employees on administrative leave to understand both the cost of backfilling any positions while they are vacant, as well as the salaries um, those expenditures of the employees while they are on administrative leave. And I would like us to consider utilizing our internal audit hours for um, this project with the goal of obtaining a report of the fiscal impact of our current HR practices and any recommendations to reduce the fiscal impact um, by possibly adjusting our, our HR practices to minimize that impact. And I would appreciate um, committee feedback as well as staff feedback. Are there any comments or discussion? Ms. Hen? Yes. Can you clarify um, administrative leave? Are we talking um, any administrative leave, uh, employees in the warehouse, um, just if you could clarify administrative leave. Sure. Any employees that for whatever reason are not performing their normal duties um, but would be receiving their, their salaries, um, their positions may or may not be backfilled, which would result in additional cost. Um, they're, as they are receiving salaries, that's a cost that the system is assuming while they are not realizing the benefits um, of that salaried employee. Those, um, those leave periods can be quite extended, and I would like for the board to understand what that fiscal impact is and if there are any recommendations that the audit group would have to minimize those um, for our current HR practices. So I would just like to, for the board to understand what that impact is and if there are any improvements that could be made to lessen that impact. I would support that. Um, this is Molly. I have a question. Do we have anybody from HR on the phone call? Because I really would like to see first the number of the past five years or so, the number of employees that are placed on administrative leave, 
the reasons they have placed on administrative leave and um, before we proceed, if it's even a viable uh, project. If we don't have a significant amount of employees that are placed, then um, I would rather use those special project hours for something else. But until we see those numbers, I can't make a decision on that. Sure. And Ms. Jones, <clears throat> it may be a very small project. Um, I have no idea of this, the size of the project without seeing those numbers myself in terms of the scope. What I would like to understand is the impact. And this could be, and I'm, I'm looking for impact, I'm looking for that information from our internal audit team in terms of what the level of effort this particular project might entail in terms of getting that data for us and the, the cost data associated with it. If it may be a matter of a simple report, it could be something much more involved. So I'm raising this as an idea and would like to know what the um, ballpark level of effort would be. So I would suggest, this is Molly again, I would suggest that we get a memo, maybe a couple pages from HR um, through the Office of Internal Audit about uh, the number of employees in the past five years or so that have been placed in administrative leave um, without obviously the names, just employees. Um, and that would give me a better direction on um, the need for this project. So it's just a numbers thing. Thank you. Are there any other comments? This is Ms. Causey. I would uh, like to uh, support both Ms. Hen and Ms. Jose's uh, comments. I do think that um, it would be a beginning point to get a initial report related to this, as Ms. Jose pointed out, from HR to the um, Office of Internal Audit to then present to the Audit Committee related to the scope of the impact on the school system. Um, Ms. Hen, I would just ask you, is there additional information that would be helpful um, in that first uh, report? And is that something that you could um, develop the, that, those pieces of information and send to um, Ms. Barr, who can then collaborate with uh, staff as designated by Dr. Williams? Well, I, I would I would like some input from Ms. Barr in terms of next steps. And if, if this is something, if perhaps there's a motion that the committee could make if this is um, of interest and if the committee agrees that this information would be useful to the board, that perhaps Ms. Barr could provide an initial level of effort with some preliminary information from HR to gauge whether we feel it would be a worthwhile use of our hours with internal audit in terms of a level of effort. So perhaps there's a preliminary um, report that Ms. Barr could provide given this information, but I would, I would ask, pose that question to her to see if we've we've defined the situation clearly enough. Ms. Barr, is that something you could comment on? I'm here, yes. Um, so I guess I do have a, a couple of questions because I heard different things. So I would ask for some clarification, Ms. Hen. Um, one thing that I heard was that you would like to understand the HR policies and procedures. So that's, that's one thing. And then the other thing that I heard was about the, the um, potential fiscal impact on the system or the organization um, related to employees that are placed on administrative leave. Did I understand that correctly? Largely. I'm, I'm interested in informing the board of the fiscal impact of employees placed on administrative leave um, the duration, because the duration will directly affect, that will, um, the fiscal impact is directly affected by the duration. So 
if there are recommendations in terms of changes or improvements to our HR practices, those may come as a result of that that report or study. I'm looking for recommendations to that effect. So it's it's twofold. Yes, you're correct. It's it's in my mind it's two separate things, and I think probably the first part would be more um, applicable to the superintendent and his staff to supply that information um, like like uh, both you and Ms. Joe suggested before even making a decision to move forward as to whether or not in my mind what I'm hearing is almost a what we would call a performance audit um, when you're looking at processes and procedures and things of that nature. That's why I'm hearing two different things. And I think the first part is really uh, belongs to the superintendent and his staff to, to provide that information. And then once that information is, is provided, there may, there may or may not be a need to move forward. Or once we get that information, looking at, looking at that information, it might be a performance audit. It might be a fiscal audit. I'm just not sure what type of, of audit it would be without having that information. So I think that's the, the black hole right now is we don't have that information. And you might be satisfied once you get that information up front that we wouldn't even have to do anything further. But again, if you're, you're asking to, for us to look at the policies and procedures, that's more like a performance uh, type audit. So I'm hearing Ms. Barr. What, what I'm initially asking for is a fiscal audit. I want to understand what the fiscal impact of our current practices are as they relate to employees being placed on administrative leave. What is the fiscal impact of that on the system? The follow-up, okay. which could be a separate project, it you know, it it's not necessarily. Um, it wouldn't have to necessarily be done based on the, the results of the first, would be a performance audit, as you said, um, depending on the results of the first. Could be if we, if, an, if a need is identified and we say there's, there's a need for improvement here, then that could result in a performance audit to say these are, are opportunities for improvement, yes. So you're absolutely um, correct. That, that may not be necessary. Mm -hmm. may, I, may I ask um, for Dr. Scriven's opinion with respect to obtaining that information? Mr. Or what thoughts you well, Dr. Scrivens, are you on mute? Oh. Did he did he hear me? I'm not sure if he's still with us on the meeting, mm -hmm. but in order to move this along um, I would like to make a suggestion. Uh, is there a way for us to um, ask Ms. Barr to initially discuss this with um, HR staff or whoever you know, she needs to within the organization to try and pinpoint this information and better understand what we're looking at in order to be able to come back to us with an idea of what it would <clears throat> to complete this administrative leave fiscal audit that Ms. Han is asking for. So this is Molly. If I could jump in real quick from having listened to Ms. Barr, thank you. You explained it pretty succinctly, and um, I kind of got the gist of it. So it seems to me that it really is something that Ms. Hen and Ms. Cosby should approach uh, the superintendent to add to our closed session uh, a discussion on the number of employees that have been placed in administrative leave in the past five or ten years, and then based on 
those numbers are short a discussion, then make a decision if there should be a special project that's brought back to the audit committee uh, and your office for a special project. Uh, it seems like it's backwards and maybe we need to start with the superintendent and come, come back based on those results and what we see uh, back to the audit committee. That's just a suggestion. Thank you. And and good afternoon. My apologies. Yes, uh, Mr. Kuhn, I, I was on mute and could not <laughs> get unmuted. Um, I would make that same recommendation. I know that Dr. Williams is currently working um, with HR in terms of areas uh, which he has identified uh, in terms of areas uh, of growth. Um, and I think in an effort to, to work parallel with what he's currently doing, uh, a, a conversation or, or a request for an update uh, would definitely be uh, appropriate and potentially beneficial uh, so you can get a snapshot of what the current work looks like, which would then better guide what your uh, potential next steps should be. Thank you, Dr. Scriven. With that information, I would suggest that, and I'm not sure if we have to table this or what we do, but I, I believe we should lay out the next steps as Ms. Hen in her capacity as chair to make this request of Dr. Williams to provide insight and leave it at that and move on since we are running out of time and have other op items we need to address. Are people amendable, amendable to that? Mr. Kuhn, this is Ms. Causey, and I, I um, appreciate Dr. Scriven coming back with us and making that suggestion. And I think that that would be an appropriate path for uh, Ms. Hen and I to uh, include that in our conversations with uh, Dr. Williams to bring that information to uh, the full board. Thank you. We'll move on to item four, the FY20 investigative unit statistical update. Mr. Fletcher, could you please um, let us know what's happening? Yes, sir. Uh, Jim, if you could, uh, for the live stream, bring up the document titled March Statistical Analysis. Go ahead, Mr. Fletcher. Okay, thank you. Um, so in taking a look at the chart, um, we did receive 11 new cases uh, in the month of March. Uh, and you can see uh, the breakdown uh, took four that were related to employee behavior, uh, two each uh, related to management issues or student issues, and then one each of a conflict of interest, misuse of resources, and payroll fraud. Uh, with those 11 cases, that brings us to 113 cases for the fiscal year. Uh, so that's 75% of the way through the year uh, as of the end of March 31st. Um, and you can see the breakdown there in the second uh, graph. Uh, most of those related, not only most, but a larger majority related to um, misuse of resources, employee behavior, and then management issues. The third chart, uh, if, if you follow down with me, uh, bottom of page one, <clears throat> shows the year-over-year um, -year analysis. And uh, for the month of March, we, are, we were kind of right where we would have anticipated uh, things to be. However, uh, it's, everything's been, been more or less turned upside down with, with the COVID-19. Uh, concerns. We have only received one case uh, in through a hotline through the, so far through the month. I'm sorry, through the month of April, uh, and so uh, we do see a downturn um, coming. Uh, don't know how long that will remain that way, but um, so far we're we're halfway through the month of April, obviously, and so uh, we, for this month we are definitely anticipating less cases. Uh, 
Uh, typically, uh, as you can see from the prior years of FY18, FY19, um, it, it's it's typically up in that high teen, um, mid to high teen area. And so we would have anticipated being there, but as of right now, we're, we're definitely not seeing those numbers. Uh, so again, as of March 31st, we're at 113. As of today, uh, right now, we're at 114. So if we go to the next page, let's see, if we slide through to the next page, um, our, this is our breakdown of fraud, waste, and abuse. So for the 11 cases that came in in March, you can see our breakdown. We had two that were fraud, one was waste, one was abuse, and then the, the remaining seven uh, are considered non-fraud, waste, or abuse. Uh, again, 113 cases uh, as of March 31st. Here's the breakdown for all 113. Um, you can see smaller portion being waste. Um, and then the the break of uh, 20 for fraud, 32 for abuse, and then uh, 59 at uh, the non-fraud waste or abuse. And then we take a look at bottom chart uh, for the three-year analysis. Uh, you can see how we compare to prior fiscal years, and we're relatively consistent. Um, no, nothing really pops out at us in terms of the types of cases that are coming into us through our through our hotline or, or cases that we are investigating. Okay. So jumping to the top of page three, and these are now cases that we have closed um, during the month of March. And so during the month of March, we did close two cases. Uh, two investigations. One of the investigations were substantiated, and the other was unsubstantiated. Uh, that second chart on page three shows that we have closed 102 uh, cases as of March 31st, and you can see the breakdown there. Um, again, 18 having some level of substantiation, 27 unsubstantiated, 16 are defined as inconclusive, and then 41 are, are uh, management issues or, or items that were uh, not invested. Are there any board member questions? Okay, with no questions or comments. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher, appreciate your time. We'd like Thank to you. move to item number five, the FY20 School Activity Fund Audit and Review Results. Ms. Manna, could you please present your information at this time? Hello, I'm here. Um, Mr. Corns, if you can move over to the PowerPoint presentation titled Chip Summary, FY2020. Go ahead, Ms. Manna. He's ready. Okay, thank you. Um, you can start with slide number two, where it displays the, uh, um, these are the number of CHIP audits that we received and conducted for FY 2020. I'm sorry, Ms. Manna. Uh, the, the agenda yes. I'm looking for is it has the FY 20 school activity fund audit and review results. Yes. Which are the, that, the CHIP audits. We perform school activity fund audits at the um, schools where there were a change in principle. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So for FY 2020, there were 23 schools that had a change in principle. And at those 23 schools, we completed a full audit at 16 of them. Um, the other seven where we only completed a limited review we looked at the last audit, the results of the last audit, and determined in a review of um, the school activity fund activity transactions and determined that a full audit was not warranted at those seven schools. So we did a limited review to ensure that the transfer of financial responsibility 
went from the prior principal to the new principal. Um, as a result of those 23 school audits, uh, the, the next area is a summary of the findings. We had three of those schools that had no findings. 11 of the schools had one to two findings. Six of the schools had three to four findings and the remaining three had the higher end of the findings, six, eight, and 11 each. I mean, I'm sorry, 13. Um, the reason for the 23 changes in principle we reviewed and 10 of them were due to retirement, two were, re were due to resignations and 11 were due to transfers to other locations. Um, if you can move to slide three, please. Slide three shows uh, the trend of the last, the current year and the last two years of the retirement versus resignations, transfers, appointments or other. Um, slide four shows the number of chip audits for uh, the current year and the last two years um, and the number of audits that had no findings. So in FY18, there were 30 chip audits with five of them that had findings. Last year in 19, there was 23 and none of them had zero findings. So all that means all of them had a finding. And then this current year, there were 23 schools and three of them had no findings. Now the next um, slide just talks about FY 2020. If you can go to slide five, please. Um, that shows the top findings of the current year issues where the number one was funds raised for student activities were not spent timely. This is where there was money in the certain accounts where either money was just sitting there or were not being used for um, the intent of that. That happened at 15 schools or 65% of the schools. The next was the written money handling procedures were not sufficient at six of the schools. And then SAF transactions were not posted to the appropriate accounts at five schools. And then the following three were at four schools each. Um, blank receipts were not issued, that were issued were not accounted for. Um, money envelopes were not available or consistently used and funds not submitted or received timely was the other finding. And then moving along to slide six, we broke out the findings of these audits into certain categories. This first one talks about the general types of audit findings and gives examples at the bottom. And then the, this, the graphic display just shows over the last three years the types of findings, the, the findings related to these types. Instead of reading each of them to you, if, um, you can see it on the screen what the examples are. We can move along to slide seven, which shows the SAF account related findings. This happens to be the area where there's probably the highest um, related to inactive accounts, high balance accounts or accounts not being used accordingly. And then slide eight is a graphic of the revenue types of findings. Typically here, either an issue with the um, um, the blank stock receipt being accounted for or the money envelope procedures. And then slide nine moves along to expenditure types of findings. Um, typically there, it's the documentation is typically the issue there or not being uh, proper type of expenditure for the accounts. And then the next one is a presentation of the transfer findings. And then moving along to slide 11 is the procurement card findings. Now this was an area where we in, took it out of the scope for last year in 19 because we were doing other types of uh, audits in the the P-card area, and in 20, were those schools where we did an assessment to determine if we were going to do a full audit versus a limited review, we did include um, a review of the premium card population to determine if we needed to look at 
um, key card transactions for those schools. And moving along to slide number 12, um, our next steps related to this project. So we will do a follow-up audit on all of these schools that had findings in our 2021 plan. Um, currently, we're starting to use some data analytics to identify any high-risk schools or areas of concern that we need to do something further on, um, including SAS and um, P cards. And then going forward in 2021 plan, we will not automatically do an audit because there's been a change in principle. We're going to do a similar type of risk assessment that we did in this past year to determine if a full audit is warranted or some type of review. Ms. Mina, thank you. Thank you for You're sharing welcome. that. I, I have a question for you. I'm sorry for the confusion. I was just, I was reading the agenda item and it didn't say chip, so it confused me. I apologize. Gotcha. But well, uh, they are school activity fund audits. Yeah. Um, the school activity funds that I'm concerned about now due to impacts from the pandemic and COVID-19 have to do with all of the money that the classes of 2020 have collected to provide for their proms and activities such as that. Are there I am aware. Plans? I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I am aware that the Office of Accounting is trying to develop some criteria for that. So that would be in um, the Office of the Controllers to assist the schools on what they need to do with those funds. We would be available to assist them with, with guidelines or anything there, but we would not be the ones to tell the schools what to do with the funds. Right, I fully understand that. My suggestion or reason for bringing it up is it's an item that is going to warrant review in the future because I believe those are significant funds. Um, I believe proms are very expensive items. I and agree. The handling of that cash um, uh, needs to be transparent to all of the students that are unable to attend a prom this season. That Mr. Kuhn, question. yes. This is George Saris. Could I? Uh, add to this discussion please please do we have uh, developed some very detailed guidelines for schools uh, with regard to school activity funds and the refunds that are going to be uh, necessary as a result of the many changes to the calendar and scheduled events so the superintendent has determined that every student and family will be made whole and fully reimbursed uh, for all fees that have been uh, accumulated this year for which uh, no benefit was received. And it's as you can imagine, going to be a, a major effort. Uh, and the Office of S School Activity Accounting, which uh, reports to the controller and to myself, is going to be working uh, very closely with schools uh, to do the refunds, um, both from a, a processing point of view. Uh, we're not going to require each school and each principal to write checks and sign checks. Uh, we're going to handle that uh, centrally in the Office of Accounting. And we're also going to help schools uh, reconcile their, uh, their records because uh, many schools do not have remote access for their bookkeepers. And so we're going to be filling in and assisting with that effort, providing reports, and uh, helping them with whatever limited access they do have. So uh, we're fully mobilized uh, and have been over the past two weeks addressing 
questions from schools. Uh, we met with the community superintendents last week to have them review the guidance that we've developed and incorporated their comments and suggestions. So uh, I believe we're in a, in a good position now to address your concerns. Thank you, Mr. Sarris. That's fantastic news, and I really appreciate you sharing that with the entire audit committee. I believe um, that's information we should probably share with the entire board so that they're all aware um, that this is happening. Um, so thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is Molly. Um, thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Some of the questions um, I was going to ask you kind of asked it already and thank you Mr. Sarris for explaining that I agree with Mr. Kuhn it should be brought to the full board um, and Ms. Manna thank you for your wonderful presentation and I'm sorry I missed one of the uh, slides and you explained it and for some yes. reason I couldn't hear it clearly was um, where you talked about the procurement card findings and why FY 2019 was not included could you just repeat that I couldn't hear you sure no problem and I apologize uh, for that that's okay uh, when we were looking at the scope of our audit for these change in principal audits, we decided to remove the P-card transactions from that audit because we were looking at them in other projects. So we did not test them at the change in principles for FY19. We did incorporate it in our risk um, assessment that we did in 2020 when we were trying to determine if it warranted a full audit or not. So we did have some review level of review of PCAR transactions in 2020. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Spana, uh, just to follow on Ms. Joseph's question, the risk assessment for PCARs that was performed in 2020, what I don't want to get into too much detail, but what did what was the result? I'm, I'm guessing you can see all the P-card activity, and you, and you did some type of a re analysis and review of that. Can you just quickly give us what sure. you found? So for the schools that we, there was a change in principle, we reviewed the population of the transactions, which was uh, fiscal year 19 was the population that we looked at in 2020. So looking at all of those transactions and looking to see if there were any questionable types of transactions we may, may have or uh, transactions that appeared to be split in nature, um, we selected a few transactions to look at when we did the test work. And we noted the types of exceptions that we noted was either the packets or documentation either wasn't complete or there were locking signatures. Thank you for sharing that. You're Are there any other comments or questions? Hearing none, we'll move on to item six, FY20 audit client survey results, Ms. Mana. Okay, Mr. Corns, the visual for that one is called summary FY2020 chip client survey results. It's a PDF file. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Mack. Thank you. So at the end of every audit, we do a client survey that goes to the principal to complete, to see, to get a kind of a report card on us to see how we're doing with certain criteria. And the questions that we ask are all listed here. There are 10 questions and, and a, a comments section is provided for them to write any comments that they wish. So it was sent out to all 23 schools where we per performed an audit. Um, we only received 14 back. We do two, typically two attempts to try and get the responses back. So we did not get it back from nine schools. Of the 14, this is a representation of what the responses were. Um, all of them were in the four and three categories of either strongly agree or agree. And then the overall comments is provided below, which were all favorable comments. What we do with this is when we have a project evaluation at the end of a group of projects like this, 
we will use this also to see if there's areas that we can improve upon, other uh, things that we can add to our process, things that we can change to our process to accommodate the, our clients, which would be the schools and the principals a little better. That's basically it with the, I mean, you can read what the comments were and the results of the responses. Thank you, Ms. Spana. Oh. With no comments or discussion. Mr. Kuhn. Like yes, go ahead. This is Ms. Causey. I do just want to uh, take a moment and thank the uh, audit office for uh, the work that they do and the survey shows the professionalism with which they conduct these audits and engage with the rest of the school community. So I appreciate their efforts and uh, appreciate them bringing um, all of these results to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. If there are no other comments, move on to the next agenda item. <coughs> FY19 change in principle follow-up results. Ms. Mana again. Okay, so this is the should be the the last presentation slide of um, this titled summary of the follow-up to the 2019 Go ahead, Ms. Mana. Okay, so there were 24 schools that we did a follow-up on this year, and these were the schools that we completed a change in principle audit in FY19. Um, of the uh, 24 schools that we did the follow-up, we only we limited the follow-up to what the findings were in the original audit. We don't do a full audit. We just look at the items that were um, reported on. So 14 of the 24, we reported back on that they resolved all of the issues, including the two highest, which were Kearney and Perry Hall Elementary that had 8 and 10 findings. All of those issues were resolved in the follow-up audit. There were 10 schools that had some type of um, unresolved or partially resolved issue. Uh, looking back, I took a look back at those schools this morning, and most of the findings that are partially resolved have to do with um, accounts where they spent, were not spending money in the original audit, uh, and they needed to come up with a plan for spending or a plan for redistribution of that money. And in most of those cases, they did some of it, but maybe not for all of the accounts. They're still working on that. So that's particularly the main issue with the partially resolved. Um, the two schools that had some unresolved findings just had to do with they had recurring issues with uh, the timely submission of money, money collected from sponsors. And the other one was the types of expenditures where still, we still found some prohibited items and expenditures. And in the follow-up, one thing we should say here is with the follow-up audits, we don't do a follow-up to the results that are still unresolved. What we do here is the community superintendents and the executive directors for these schools are asked to work with the principals to ensure that the unresolved issues are addressed. Thank you, Ms. Spana. Are there any questions or comments regarding this follow-up? Hearing none, I would like to thank you and um, move to conclude the, the open part of the meeting. Um, and we'll be moving into the administrative function. Do I have a motion to adjourn to administrative function? So moved, Ms. Causey. Do I have a second? Second, Ms. Mack. Ms. Duckworth, please conduct a roll call of the committee for the vote. Yes, sir. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Joes? <laughs> yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Thank you. <laughs>